Build, what is up? Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte, and we are here live at the Build Studio in New York City. Our next guest, debut novel Smothered, has just dropped, and it is fantastic. Told via journal entries, text messages, emails, bills, receipts, tweets, doctors, prescriptions, job applications, and rejections, uh, parking tickets, and of course... Pug Pictures, uh, Smothered tells the story of two youngish women uh, just trying to get it right and learning uh, that just because we all grow up doesn't necessarily mean that we have to grow old. That's very sweet. Uh, this book is really, it's honestly super wonderful, and I'm very excited to talk to her. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise. Autumn Chiklis is right here. Come on. I've said it a million times already in the five minutes that I've met you that I love this book. Uh, I will continue to say that because I do. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> no, that means the world to me. I, um, I, please continue to say it. Got it. Okay. It well, great. we have about 20 minutes to kill, so this is it. I'm going right, to tell right. you. Uh, <laughs> um, no, genuinely, it's super funny, and uh, I'm a sucker for a, a good mom-daughter relationship story, and there's just there's so much great stuff going on here. We're going to get into it, but of course, since we do have time, how are you? How is Autumn doing I'm right great. now? great. I am on cloud nine right now. I mean, my book just dropped yesterday, probably the most exciting day of my my life. When did it drop? Just yes. yesterday. Hold for, for applause. Book dropped oh, yesterday. Thank you guys. Thank you. It's a big deal. There you go. You got it. Right. So um, <laughs> yeah, it's been a really exhilarating 24 hours. I just flew out from Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, I, I could not be happier. That's awesome. Um, so it just Had dropped. Had a bagel this morning. It's great. Oh, great. That's perfect. <laughs> Yeah, you come from L.A. and you come to New York, the first thing you have to do is... Have a bagel. Have a Pizza's later. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. You got the menu planned out. You know it's going to happen. Um, how long did you work on this book? How, how Start to finish. What's sure. So I started writing it the end of my senior year of college. Okay. Which was two years ago. And then I sold it pretty quickly out of college. And then I was given a deadline. So, you know, some, some books you come with a finished product when you sell it. Sometimes you write a proposal, which is how I went about doing it. So then I was given this deadline of July. So all in all, it took about a year and three months to write. How are you with deadlines? Are they? Do they? I, I am actually, I'm actually really good with deadlines. Cool. Um, psychologically speaking, they, I will get it done if you give me a deadline. God knows if I will if you don't. Um, but if you gave me 24 hours to get ready, I would use all 24 hours. And I used all year and three months to write that book. That's pretty amazing. So I've got to imagine, one of the questions I love to ask, because we tip, I mean, naturally, when we have an author come through, it's because their book was just released. And so still fresh in their mind is that moment uh, of you've walked into the store, it's a real thing, it's a, there's a stack of them. Like, what, what does that feel like? What, what was that moment like for you when you first saw your book? Top five moments of my life actually was, I went to the Barnes & Noble in Studio City, which is where I'm from. I'm, I'm a true Valley girl uh, in Los Angeles. And um, I walked in with my family, and they actually videotaped it. It was really cute. It was the night before, because yesterday I flew out here. Yeah, so we went just to see if they had the books already in. And we walk in, and sure enough, there they are. And I Instagrammed it. And you've read the book. The girl who Megan uh, Mitchell is based on is actually my best friend. And so I Instagrammed this, and she shows up at the bookstore in her pajamas, and the two of us started take, you know, taking pictures and sobbing outside of the Barnes & Noble. So it was really, really a, a special moment for me. That sounds amazing. That is a beautiful moment. You know, it's in okay, so that's interesting, because I know, obviously, like, uh, you, you take creative liberties and things are embellished for comedic effect and stuff like that, and I do want to talk about that part of the process, but, like, were you ever worried at all that anyone like your best friend or like your mom would, would misinterpret the comedic embellishment and think, oh. like, is this what you really think about me? Oh, totally, 100%. What's interesting is people ask me that about mom and it's the total opposite with my mom she is hamming it up she's leaning into she it, it yeah. she is you know she'll go shopping and go i have fans now i have to uh i have to cater to to my audience she's been waiting her whole life for this i truly she really has this is the, her time to shine yeah but um i have worried because i really tried hard to get little representations of all of my closest friends and the people who are closest to me in my life yeah. into the book but you know, it's a comedy, so for the most part, they're not in the most. Fly I would, I would honor someone 
and it might not necessarily be in the most flattering light. Yeah. So I was saying earlier how I made one of her best friends really terrible at cooking, and I and I called mom once and I said, I need you to tell them that they're not bad at cooking. I just needed someone to be bad at cooking. <laughs> so I, I have a million little moments of going, Megan's gonna think that I hate her, yeah, and yeah. you know, so and so is going to think that I crashed her car or whatever it is. So that's got to be one of those things that you have to work through while while you're writing this. This is your this is your first book, your debut novel. How far into the process did it start to finally feel like a real thing? Like, cause, wow. yeah. When I saw it yesterday. Really? Okay. It wasn't <laughs> yeah. until the end. It really, yeah. I, I had my moments. So the thing about writing is you do it from home for the most yeah. part. Sometimes I would go to a coffee shop or a different place. I have my designated writing areas, if you will, <laughs> just to get out of the house. But for the most part, I moved back in with my parents after college and I wrote this book. I said it was for research. <laughs> I just followed my mom around for a year. Um, uh, writing down everything she did. But we, um, you have these moments as a writer because you're in your pajamas where you feel like you could just be on Facebook writing a status. You, you don't really realize it's going to be, in, it's going to smell like fresh print and there's going to be gloss on it and you're going to see it in a bookstore. So um, it was mostly a lot of, you know, excitement and frustration punctuated by these moments of exhilaration, like, oh my God, it's going to be this big on a thing. I didn't know it was going to be this big, but you know, I'm I'm going to actually physically be able to hold it in my hands and show my friends. And really, only when I got the book did I feel like I did it. It's yeah. done. So, um, so I want to talk about because I know, and you've had to talk about this a lot, like the idea of where it came from and all that. And I know that you started sharing, uh, you know, a while ago, posts of interactions between you and your mom, and they kind of blew up in a way. Your friends were reposting them and tagging their moms and, and then their friends and so on and so forth. So you knew there was like something there. There was like, a little bit of lightning in a bottle. There was was that the true impetus of like this needs to be a, a, a larger thing. I need to find a way to share this story in a different way. Is that where it started when that kind of spark ignited? Absolutely. So I actually remember the moment really vividly. It was when I um, I posted a status. It wasn't even a text message because I do post a lot of my mom's texts because they're completely outrageous. I have them on my Instagram and Facebook. They're very funny. Um, she's a riot. But I wrote a status because we had just gotten a puppy in my family. And my mom came in after just getting her, getting her hair done. And she goes, oh, my goodness, parenting is so passe. Autumn, please make me a martini. Sometimes you have to drink your calories. And I, <laughs> I wrote a status about that because I said, no one on earth speaks like that in real life. And it blew up. And it was when I started getting more likes than I had ever received on anything in my life that I realized there really was something special here. And that's when I started posting the texts. And once I realized it wasn't a fluke, it wasn't just this particular text was really, really funny and that everything my mom says is kind of hilarious, um, I realized that that dynamic was actually kind of special and that there was something to to be had there. Was it always conceived, of, like, in terms of finding the right vehicle? Because it's like when you do, uh, people have struggled with this for years. I remember years ago there was, like, shit my dad said had, like, turned into a TV show and people were like, eh, we liked it better when it was just a thing that we saw on the internet once in a while. Like, did you struggle with figuring out how to take this this lightning in a bottle and, and, and turn it into another medium or another format? Was it always going to be a book? Were there other ideas that you explored? Before. That's an interesting question, and no, it wasn't always going to be a book. It, it went through a lot of different stages, and it's interesting you bring that up because I know in terms of adapting anything that is successful, there's a real challenge in it because mediums require different things. Um, for example, when you there's a real art form for from uh, adapting a book into a television series or a movie because what someone really responded to in a book may be the prose, and there are no prose in a television yeah. uh, show. You, it's all visual. It's all visual components. So how do you take the essence of one medium and then bring it into something else? So um, the in, my initial instinct was a TV show because I grew up in film and television, so that's where my brain goes immediately. And I started playing around with that, and the idea of a book, actually, I've always wanted to write a book. I should throw this out there, but I thought I would do it when I was like 60 and knew what I was doing and had like, a brain in my head, but um, I always wanted to write a book, and um, I, I thought about making kind of a coffee table book with all of the text messages yeah. to kind of create an existing property or to um, just to kind of get the text out there because that is the truest form or the text. Right. And so I wrote a pitch for that book, and I sent it around to different people, and that's how I met my now agent, Aaron Malone, who is amazing. And she was the one who actually said, hey, I think that there's a voice here. I think that this is really funny. And I think that there is a way to incorporate this into something more. Do you think you can write a novel? And for whatever reason, I said yes. Yeah. 
and that's how that came to be. So uh, pretty amazing. I do love the romanticized later. idea of like when I'm older, I'll write my story. Right. Like, like oh, that's it makes sense. It's like when I'm old, I'll have something to say. No, I have something to say. But it's like you shouldn't shut yourself out to that idea because you had tons to say right here, and here we have this wonderful book. Um, so okay, so we we get to that point. You, this is what it's going to be. It's going to be a book. Uh, the way that they're just kind of integrated with into the story, the way they sometimes move the story forward, other times they're just you know little funny punctuations and funny moments. Um, what was that conversation like? Did you write around the texts? Did you make the story and then find ways to fold them in? Like, how did you merge these worlds? You know, it was a challenge. It was definitely a challenge because what I had to start with were these text messages that were between me and my mom. And I had to fictionalize them, bring these characters to life, and then create a narrative around it that actually had an arc, a beginning, middle, and end that wasn't just this repetitive, mom's funny and irresponsible and the daughter is over it. Like that just becomes, you know, a one trick pony. So um, I, I, the book itself, I did not have a, um, a plot for when I started writing it. I just had the dynamic and I had to work kind of backwards from there, which is interesting and very different than anything I've ever done as a writer. Um, so what I would normally do is there were certain texts I knew I wanted to have in there, just slightly altered. Yeah, I recognize some of the real ones. <laughs> exactly. There, there were some that I just said, this is too good. It works too well with the given circumstances that I've presented here. So um, I'll start with those. And I knew that I wanted this to be a story about a girl who moves back in with her mom after school. Yeah. And the challenge with that is you have to keep her at home. And you have to make sure, you know, and how do you keep it from not just getting repetitive of, you know, daily shenanigans? Right. So um, it, it was definitely kind of sitcom format oriented. How do I tell, how do I keep this core dynamic the focus and still drive a plot forward? So the text really just became a device for finding yeah. what this through line was. So cool. Uh, how involved, if at all, did you uh, allow your mom to be with the process? Like, how far did you get before you let her read any of it or see any oh, of it? Oh, she read every iteration of this thing. It's you, really cute. You read it at home. Surprised she wasn't, like, there with you while you were doing well, it. Well, she had her moments where she'd peek her head into my room and be like, hey, um, do you have any chapters for me to read? Uh, what what <laughs> really? am I doing this week? Um, so she she was very involved in the sense that she, she read a lot of it. She um, was obviously my biggest cheerleader throughout. But in terms of the actual writing, she didn't, you know, she wasn't, no, she didn't overstep at all. She was very, um, she was actually wonderful in being supportive of the creative process and letting me do what, she actually said to me at one point, Autumn, don't worry about offending me. You need to make this book funny. I don't care how it seems like I may be portrayed. I know that I am not this woman. You need to do what is right for this book. It's really cool for her to go out of her way to say that and sort of give you that that freedom. Of she just did. be like, don't let this hang over your head. I know what this is. Like, don't lose sleep. I'll be fine. Exactly. <laughs> um, the Red Hots. I love the Monday ritual of the Red Hot. Is that a real thing? That oh, yeah. Oh, goodness. Was there a big blowout this past Monday for the finale? Okay, so here's the thing about the Red Hots is um, <laughs> they are, my mom's best friends are the Red Hot Lady. Yeah. It's a twist on the red hat ladies. <laughs> and they uh, get together every Monday and do bachelor nights. They do pizza and sangria nights. And they are the most fabulous group of women I have ever met. And I really, it's funny, you bring, you're the first person to mention them. And I'm really glad you did because they're actually one of my favorite parts of this book. Yeah. Because I think that this is a demographic that people do not pay nearly enough attention to media wise, where, you know, 50 something year old women, 40, 50, 60 year old women whose kids are now out of the house. Mm -hmm. And so they're having this renaissance of adolescence. They're still fun and want to travel and experience things and get yeah. together. You know, they're not ready to start knitting and, you know, uh, play bridge. Right, right. They're not, you know, in that stage of life yet. They still have a lot of chutzpah. And it's, it's great to... Thank you, thank you. Um, but yeah, it's it's. I wanted to kind of represent a group of women who had it more together than she did because there's such this emphasis on youth and you know being 20 and so fun. Being 20 is terrifying. It's you don't know what you're doing. You're a mess. And I they give me a reason to be excited about turning 50 instead of it just being like my glory days are behind me. So exactly, that was, uh, that's what I I loved about them is that. 
uh, it, it, there's just so much fun and exuberance behind what they're doing. And it's like, I don't even watch The Bachelor or Bachelorette, but it's like, it sounds like a fun party that they're having. <laughs> I never <laughs> I did. I was super snooty about it yeah. for the longest time. I would hold out and be like, oh, you guys are watching this show. And now I'm totally into it. I'm bummed really? when they don't come over. Because <laughs> it's so it's such a fun gathering of these women, and they bring food, and they're drinking yeah. rosé, and they're dancing, and exactly. they've it totally converted like me. Party. I'm totally out of my depth uh, in, in talking about this at all, but we had Becca and Garrett here yesterday. Uh, yeah, they were here. Yeah, it was this place. They, they packed the house. The of course they did. Like, of course they did. Come in from all over. It's uh, so funny and, and one of the things I gleamed from side conversations was their debate over the the choice of Garrett. Was that a controversial choice in in the Red Hots household? Well, unfortunately, for this was the one week we didn't get to do it because oh, no. I know, I know, it's been it, the week. It was the week, and I and I got text messages on the group chat. Let me tell you, but um, people had opinions. <laughs> Uh, but I Fair was, enough. I've I've been busy with this, unfortunately. The, yeah, I imagine you've been a little busy. Yeah. The less important uh, <laughs> thing in my life here. It's kind of hard to peel away from this. Too. <laughs> yeah. um, we're in a little bit. We're going to go to the audience. We'll get some questions, and then I have a few more questions before we get over there. Sure. Uh, we've talked a lot about the similarities between uh, the characters in the book, your mom and, and her character, and your best friend, all that. But uh, Lou, from what I understand. Pretty different from yourself. Like, there's, Very. yeah, pretty different, exactly. So, what some of those core differences, and then how you went about making those character tweaks, like what those decisions were like. Yeah. It's interesting because with Lou, I really struggled because where the dynamics started with me and my mom was that I was the responsible one doing the right thing, and then mom was crazy, and that was just kind of the fun of it. Um, I'm, I think I am the furthest from Lou than anyone is in this book, interestingly. Um, and I was really struggling with what do I do with this character who, I, it wasn't funny. For the first like two months I was writing this, it just wasn't funny and I couldn't figure out why. And it's, and it's this is a weird thing to say, but I, re, I was so worried about making her likable and she was so boring. She just kind of was, you know, applying to jobs and doing her thing and mom's crazy and there was, no, there was nothing there. Yeah. And so I had to separate myself. I actually was watching The History of Comedy, and I can't remember Love who that. said it. Yeah. It's a great show. It's so good. And um, I kind of needed this reminder. I was so concerned, like, how do, I'm making these people so entitled, uh, entitled and unlikable. And someone uh, said, don't worry about making your comedic characters likable, because we don't watch comedy to watch really good people yeah. doing the best that they can. Exactly. Um, so with Lou specifically, I, I realized, you know what, I need to give her somewhere to go, and I need her to have an arc. Yeah. It can't just be her being responsible. She ha yes, she is the responsible one, but she's also, you know, she's pretty lazy in moments. She's entitled. Yeah. She uh, thinks she deserves things because she has this degree, and she's woefully unprepared. Yeah. Uh, she went to Columbia and got a double degree, and she's very, very ambitious, and her heart is in the right place. But she has no idea what she's doing, and she's realizing that her education didn't necessarily prepare her for what the real world is. And so I, I really had to kind of take a step back from myself and go, all right, who are the people you know in your life who have the best intentions and who are brilliant and wonderful people, but they are flawed inherently and need to need to get their life together and need to learn some lessons. So I really wanted her to kind of evolve as the story continues. Um, did you, so, and she totally does that, and you've hit that on the head. Did you, when you were talking about how she's just out of school, she has these degrees, she has no idea what she's doing, surely you connected to some of that. Like, that's the stuff sure. that you're pulling from, in, from internally, because I feel like that's a universal truth. It's like, we all come out of school, uh, and, and then it's like, I did it, now what? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, as different as Lou and I are, we definitely have a lot of core. Like, yeah. our voices are very similar. And, um, you know, a lot of my own faults I, you know, wrote into her. You, you fold in there. And yeah, of like course. That. I fold in there in a lot of ways. But that that moment of graduation. And it's funny. I was super cocky about it. Because when I graduated, I felt like, I'm, re I'm so ready to graduate. I'm yeah. done with college. And then I did. <laughs> and that's a very different experience when you, you know, the first two weeks out of college, you're on this high. And then you realize it's summer forever now. <laughs> and I and it's oh, very no. easy. It's very easy to just become this person who walks back and forth from the pantry going like one day I'll get a job. I got straight A's in psych. Like it's it's, exactly. it's very easy to fall into that. So um I 
even though I, I was very lucky that I actually got this book deal pretty quickly out of college, so I, I wasn't floundering in the same way for work, yeah, yeah. Um, I was able to pull a lot of my, my lowest moments. Mm -hmm. The moments where, you know, I didn't wash my hair for a week and a half, yeah. and the moments where I kept saying to myself, today I'm going to be productive, and then I find myself at, like, 6 p.m. on YouTube watching, like, serial killer documentaries. Like, how did I get here? Wait, Alberto hits you up. I don't have to give away one of the jokes. And he's like, hey, iTunes called, and it's, <laughs> I suppose that, like, you just bought the entire series of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah. I just want to, <laughs> seems excessive. I want to make sure your card wasn't stolen <laughs> and you're not having identity theft. Oh, yeah. I, I We do it, have a guy. So many great moments like that. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. Um, all right, last thing I'm going to do before we turn it over to the audience. Yes. I saw a post on your Instagram. You did an audio book. I right. did. I did an audio book. <laughs> I'm always fascinated by that process, that you've spent forever writing this thing, and now you were forced to sit down and read it aloud for uh, endless, endlessly. I, I imagine it goes on. How was it, recording the audio book? What is that like? It was amazing yeah. and terrifying. I had to reread my book. Exactly. A year. It's already done. A year after it was written, which is scary. I don't know if there are any writers here, but when you reread your own material, yeah. you go through this weird saga of, oh, this is pretty funny, to this is the worst trash anyone's ever written, how is anyone going to read this, to actually, you know what, that's a funny joke. Like, you go through all of the... You Go, through go look the at your Twitter feed from six weeks ago. No. And you will want to jump jump out the building. Yes. Like, it is. I thought that was funny. It, exactly. It's just like you think in the moment, it, yeah, I am the smartest and funniest person ever to Love say her. this thing. And then it's like you read it and like, oh. Sure. The yeah. audiobook was so interesting. Um, I drank a lot of tea that week. I was really lucky that my director and um, the engineer were absolutely lovely people and awesome. they were so generous with me. And I was, I had to audition for it, actually. Did you really? Yeah, I, they don't normally, um, it's not common that authors will get to read their own stuff, but I grew up a performer, so it, I was able to kind of slide in there. You got to wonder who was the first, like that it couldn't have always been the practice. And at one point, some author must have came in and they were like, oh, we got to start auditioning now because this guy, <laughs> he's going to read the whole book. This is how it's going to sound the whole time. And so now they audition. Like, exactly. I, so I did have to audition, which was a trip. Like, what if I don't? get it. Yeah. <laughs> what if I you don't, don't get sound this? enough like you. Exactly. I'm like, who's going to sound more like me than me? Um, I'm sure there's someone, but I, uh, <laughs> there's someone with like it's a better right? voice, just like a sexier Billions voice, you know, of people. with a British accent. I don't know. That's but, how, yeah, exactly how you hear yourself. Exactly. Um, but having, it was the first time I had to read it from start to finish and see how that, and I, I wanted to change a million things right away, of course. But I loved the experience because I, it really kind of made me face it. And also, it was just fun to get to read it out loud and to start voicing these characters who I hadn't even really... Like, I had voices in my head that are not in my register, so I had to, you know, come up with yeah. different characters, and it was just a blast. Was there ever a thought given to your mom doing her own voice? Oh, yeah. I, actually, I, <laughs> Whose idea was that? No, I, hers. Um, yeah. No, we, uh, <laughs> we, we talked about maybe she could do a special appearance, but I, I barely made it through the skin of my teeth to yeah. be able to do this yeah. audiobook, and apparently appear guest appearances are not a thing that are common in audiobooks. <laughs> Feels obvious, too, right? You know, you know what you got to do if, they, if the opportunity, not that you pre-record it, but because of just the voice and some of the dialogue, you got to have your dad uh, in character, Okay, and his choice, whatever character he wants. Maybe he wants okay. to do the commission. Maybe he wants to do Ben Grimm. But the juxtaposition of that tough guy image that we all have no. reading that dialogue, I think, fly off the shelves. So Vic, Vic Mackey meets Smothered. Exactly. Vic Mackey is Smothered. It's going to turn go. into a very different book. Real it's quick. a totally different book. Yeah. Uh, the, Tell me you wouldn't listen. I don't want to spoil anything, but the ending would have been very different <laughs> if Vic Mackey was Charlie Hans. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I would listen. I, I would. I will pitch that. <laughs> I will pitch that idea for the sequel. You got an in, from what I understand. Thank you. I will give. I, you uh, will get uh, residuals. <laughs> exactly. All right. So we got a couple of questions. Let's go ahead and throw it to the audience. We got microphones out there. First one looks like it's right here. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering since uh, this book has uh, plenty of uh, st uh, stories between you and your mom, were there anything that uh, didn't make it into the book that you wish was in there, but it couldn't? Oh, there is so much. I have, I have 24 years worth of material with this woman. <laughs> Not everything made the 300 pages. Um, off the top of my head, I'm trying to think of a story. I mean, uh, recently, just the other day, actually, this didn't not make the book, but there have been 
plenty of circumstances after I finished writing that um, I went, God, I wish... I wish this had happened before I finished publishing because this fits in perfectly. Yeah, th there were definitely things that did not make it that, not because they weren't funny, but just because they didn't fit into it. Uh, you can look at the text messages for that because there are plenty. Um, was, the, was the cocaine joke in the book? I can't remember. <laughs> there was so I uh, spoiler alert. There was a, there was once a, there was once a text, and I went back and forth between putting this in the book. It may have been cut. You can tell me if yeah, you remember it. Too, too. But um, I, I lost uh, a significant amount of weight when I was in college, and my mom texted me. She went, "Autumn, you look so good. I've been looking at your pictures. It looks like you lost a lot of weight. Uh, tell me, are you doing cocaine?" <laughs> and I said, "Oh my God, Mom, no, Jesus, I'm not doing cocaine." And she texts back and goes, "Oh, don't worry, I won't tell your father. I just want to know if it works." So. I don't. I don't vividly remember. So that, that got cut. <laughs> That's when that got cut. I think that got cut. I was thoroughly impressed with uh, going through your feed. Uh, the, the, the line uh, about. I, I, I just want to make sure you're not a hippie. The way like the, that you that happened. I saw the text and I was like, oh my god, that happened pretty recently. And she folded that into the book. She got that in there. Yeah, Wait, I, I snuck a few. Yeah, you snuck a few in there. It's pretty great. Uh, thank you for that question. What we got? One more. We're gonna do one more uh, right here. Hi. Um, I'm super excited to read your book, yeah. um, but I was just wondering if you had any advice for aspiring writers out there. Of course. Oh, my goodness. I, I feel so silly giving advice. I'm like, I, I'm not old enough or wise enough to give advice. Um, I, I will say this, though, just from my experience with this, because I learned so much. Um, I would say be open to the pivot is something that my parents and I kind of talk about, which is be open to seeing what people are responding to in your own life, because... It will, it's so funny how often we kind of, we are so set on the path that we choose for ourselves that we kind of miss the things that are right in front of our nose. And the only reason this came about is because people were responding to it so loudly and uh, it became so clear that there was, this touched people, there was an audience for this. So I guess the one thing that I can with confidence say is be very cognizant of the things in your, what people respond to in your life and be, be kind of uh, open to the peripheral roads in your life that may take you to writing a book. Or, or do, you, do you write books or do you write uh, screenplays? Or screenplay. You write screenplays? Um, well, then you are obviously very observational, so that's not going to be an issue. But I, I would say that whatever it is that you are writing be open to responding to what kind of the the outside world is telling you in terms of oh wow when i you know when i when i say this people laugh or when i write this people become really emotional if you become aware of yourself because what i talked about you being observational sometimes we become so observational at writers we forget how people perceive us so i would just say be very cognizant to the way people respond cuz you'll find some of your best material that way i think if, if I have anything to Great. say. Uh, thank you so much for that thank question. Thank you. Uh, we're going to wrap it up. The, there was one, I was going through my cards to make sure I hit everything that I wanted to talk to you about. There's one question I wanted to ask, because yeah. uh, we know damn well your parents are watching. Uh, so they Lou, <laughs> Lou uh, keeps a, a pretty big secret from the family for a long time. Is What's the longest you've ever had to keep something from your family? The longest I had to keep something from my family. I'll do you wow. one better. What's something they don't know? Go ahead. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's do it right now. <laughs> Let's do it right now. Hi, Mom. Yeah, what, what, um, let's see, I, and let's watch your phone blow up in real time. I, I, think I, be I, I had a bagel this morning, Mom. I did it. There we go. No, um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I would say the longest thing I ever had to keep from my parents. I don't mean I'm, dark. You know, we're all. No, 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 no. Exactly no. I, I'm like, I'm really going through it because I was very lucky in my house that my, my, there was one rule in my house, only one. And it was if you tell the truth, you don't get in trouble. And um, they really kept to that. Yeah. I got away with a lot because of that. <laughs> and um, they, uh, so I was really lucky that I was able to be very open with them. But the things that I would hide yeah. are the things that were interestingly not like, I, Mom, I'm, I'm doing drugs or, you know, I'm, I'm doing something terrible. I'm getting bad grades. They were always things that were a lot more personal, like, wow, I'm really scared to release this book because I think everyone's going to hate you and hate me. Or like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm terrified that if I, uh, I'm going to disappoint you. Or like things that are a lot more personal. So um, it, I'm lucky that I haven't had to keep like, 
you know, uh, a box, you know, the little box under the bed with like my cigarettes or something. Uh, but I, the things that I've kept the longest from my parents are t that tend to be things of the heart. Um, and they're pretty good at getting that out of me too. So I think I'm pretty, pretty fortunate. Awesome. Well, that's something, uh, even if it is adapted and even if it is uh, fictionalized and enhanced for comedy, you do get a sense of a really strong family unit in this book. I think that cuts through. And um, uh, congratulations. You know, I, I really did enjoy I got to read a lot of stuff working on this show. I got to watch a lot of stuff. This is a fantastic summer read. I really did enjoy it. It made me laugh. And, and I'm really excited you were here to hang out with us. Thank so, you so, so much. it's that's out now. Delightful. Everybody. Oh, I'm so, I hope you had fun. Did you have a good I time? I had a blast. Thank you, Wonderful. guys. Wonderful. Guys, please put your hands together. Smothered is out now. Make some noise for Autumn Chicklist, please. Delight. <laughs>